It's always easiest to format videos on players when they have really defined strengths and weaknesses, and there's no one that that's more true of than Nate Davis. In pass protection, he struggles at times with anchor and hand placement, and sometimes his technique is so bad that I don't even know where to start critiquing it, but in my opinion, he's second only to Derrick Henry himself in terms of value that he brings to the Titans' run game, and he paved the way for a good portion of Derrick Henry's big runs last season. In my preparation for this video, I've watched every Nate Davis snap multiple times over, and aside from the performance disparity between run blocking and pass blocking, there were a couple bigger things that stood out to me. First of all, Nate Davis has made significant improvement not only from year one to year two, but from the start to the finish of each of those seasons. And second, Tennessee's scheme is set up in a way that Davis's weaknesses are hidden and his strengths are magnified. So in 2020, Davis received a 73.8 PFF grade with a 71.1 run blocking grade and a 53.9 pass blocking grade. But his performance improved significantly over the second half of the season, especially in run blocking, where he played like a legitimate top 10 guard. We see a similar trend looking at his PFF grades from his rookie year. Over the first 15 weeks of the season, Davis graded as the worst starting guard in the NFL but he improved a ton over the final five games of the season, and then he continued that progression into his second year. Even though his pass blocking hasn't improved at the same rate as his run blocking, he nearly halved his blown block rate from 2019 to 2020, and he decreased his pressure rate as well. And this improvement isn't just limited to the more abstract analytics. You can see it when you look at how Derrick Henry's productivity changes depending on what direction he's running. If we look just at Derrick Henry's efficiency when running through either of Nate Davis's gaps, so that's the A and the B gap on the right side, we see that Davis's theoretical improvement in performance yields tangible results for Tennessee's offense. From the first half of 2020 to the second half, Henry averaged over a yard more per carry when running behind Nate Davis, he was hit at the line of scrimmage 17% less often, and he was stopped for a loss of yards 6% less often. He was also 8% more likely to run through the design gap of the play, which indicated that Nate Davis was losing fewer blocks and opening up bigger holes. And Davis wasn't just a good run blocker in 2020, he was actually the strength of Tennessee's offensive line. When running behind Nate Davis, Derrick Henry averaged the second most yards before contact and the most expected points added when compared with Tennessee's other linemen. This is a significant change from 2019 where Davis was the clear weak link as a run blocker. I just wanted to start by talking about Nate Davis's improvement because I think it's important to take into account a player's development trajectory when projecting future success. A player who progresses this significantly from season to season and even game to game is a lot more likely to develop even further compared with someone who hasn't shown any progress at all. And I think a good portion of Davis's relatively fast progression can be attributed to the fact that he was pretty much tailor-made to play in the West Coast offense that Tennessee runs. He's not a great pass blocker, but Tennessee moves the pocket around a lot on designed rollouts off of play action, where the offensive line isn't really asked to pass block in the traditional sense. These plays are designed to move the defense in one direction while the quarterback rolls out and executes quick passing concepts in the opposite direction. In 2020, Tennessee ran the eighth most play action rollouts in the NFL and the fourth most play action in general. This combined with the rushing threat of Derrick Henry shielded Tennessee's offensive line from facing a lot of full force pass rushes. Defensive linemen are just way less likely to pin their ears back and rush the quarterback because they're prioritizing their run fits a lot more. But Tennessee's scheme doesn't just hide Nate Davis's weaknesses, it shows off his strengths as well. Davis has the athleticism and explosiveness to have potential in his own blocking scheme, but he's developed the technical ability to allow him to be great. I'll oversimplify zone blocking rules really quick for those who have heard the term but don't know exactly what it is. So looking at this play versus Baltimore, Tennessee's running outside zone to the left, and Dennis Kelly, the backside tackle, is just going to seal off the backside edge defender. The rest of the linemen's responsibilities depend on whether they're covered or uncovered, meaning is there someone in their play side gap? Nate Davis is covered here, so his goal is to reach block the defensive lineman and seal him off towards the backside. Ben Jones is uncovered and is responsible for blocking the linebacker at the second level after he makes sure that Davis secures the reach block. 
What Jones does here is the main thing that differentiates outside and inside zone because an inside zone, his primary goal would be to get to the second level as quickly as possible, but an outside zone, he takes a lateral step play side. And then Saffold and Kessenberry are both covered, so they'll reach block the play side defender as well. Davis's ability to consistently pull off reach blocks, which are incredibly difficult, makes him a valuable asset for a team that runs as much zone as Tennessee. Last season, the Titans used zone blocking on 74% of their run plays, which was the most in the NFL. The reach block is foundational to any outside zone scheme, and Nate Davis shows perfect technique on this play against Houston. The first step on a reach block has to be explosive, it has to cover a lot of ground, and it needs to be lateral. And the angle of that first step is going to depend on the alignment of the defensive player. If he's in a wider alignment, that first step needs to be even more horizontal. It's also important that he keeps his shoulders as square with the line of scrimmage as possible, which protects against linebackers shooting the gap, and it also puts him in better position to make contact as the play develops. After his first step, Davis has negated the defender's positional advantage, and he'll follow it with an aggressive upfield step with the eyes on the outside numbers, the outside hand on the armpit, and the inside hand down the middle. A lot of teams will have linemen place the inside hand on the shoulder or use it as a trail hand, but the Titans want that hand inside on the breastplate because it makes it a lot easier to stay tight with the defender. The reach block is different from a lot of other blocks in that when you land your punch, you're not extending it, you're keeping your hands inside and trying to lock your hips to the defender. One thing that Tennessee's offensive line coach Keith Carter really prioritizes is taking the angle that the defender gives you. When a lineman emerges from his stance and makes contact, he needs to keep his hips square with that initial angle, and looking at this play against Detroit, we see what happens when Davis doesn't do this. So the start to this rep is good as far as hand placement and helmet over the outside number, but then he rotates his hips to try to change the angle he's driving the lineman. So if two people are pressing each other at full force and one guy loosens his hips to try to adjust his angle, the other person is just going to continue to drive right through him, which is exactly what happens on this play. And here's Coach Carter talking about this on a practice rep that involves Nate Davis. The part that really bothers me about this, this block for him is watch his hips kind of wiggle right here. He kind of slides to the right and then slides back to the left. All right. We want him to stay through his landmark. Stay right here on this block. Keep your hips, knees, ankles, and shoulders square through the outside half of this and just keep running and taking them right here. We can look at what's probably Davis's best reach block from last season to show how it's supposed to be done. Obviously, in an ideal world, you'd be able to drive a guy backwards in the complete opposite direction that he's trying to go, but it's just not physically possible to reset your momentum and then regain it and match the momentum of an NFL player. So instead of rotating his hips, he keeps them locked and drives in the direction that he's given, but throughout the play, he's still working towards the outside shoulder and adjusting his angle naturally without sacrificing his momentum. This is one reason that that first step is so important because you really need to win that part of the rep if you want to be in good position later. One exception to this is when the lineman goes to the backside to start out, you've got to be able to recover, which involves flipping your hips and resetting your angle, but the first step still needs to be lateral. So Detroit's lineman is going to take a false step initially, so Davis has the space where he can turn around without getting beat. And something that Keith Carter talks a lot about, which goes in tandem with maintaining the starting angle, is letting the back make you right, which basically means that it's the lineman's job to block what he's given, and it's the running back's job to have the vision to hit the hole. Right here, Jacksonville's nose tackle takes a really wide angle backwards to start out, but instead of trying to turn and drive him backwards, Nate Davis just carries him straight. And then I'll let Coach Carter also break down this rep against Green Bay, where pretty much the same thing's happening. Here's our right guard, man reaching the three. Speed off the ball, hit your landmark run, let the back make you right, okay? I don't like the start of his left hand. You can see that his left hand is high on that shoulder, okay? So that fit replace drill that we did, he then replaces, gets in this guy's chest, and he runs and presses, all right? It's Derek's job now to make Nate on this man reach right. On the backside of outside zone, you have what's called an A block, which is a combo block between the center and the guard, where the guard is covered, so he's gonna reach block, and the center is uncovered, so he gives a stiff arm to assist the guard, and then he climbs to the second level to take on the linebacker. Ben Jones does a really good job on these, like you see on this play. He disrupts the lineman to the extent that Davis can just bury him out of the play instead of having to carry him downfield. 
Another type of combo block you'll see is what's called an overtake, where the guard's covered but the center isn't. And so Davis's role is going to start out the same as a normal reach block, but here he actually is going to extend and really try to win with length, because number one, the center needs that space to take over the block, and number two, Davis needs to bounce himself free to get to the second level and block the linebacker. And there's also variations of this combo block where the guard just does the one-handed stiff arm before moving downfield, and it's dependent on the alignment of the defensive front mainly. On this play, you see Davis land a great jam, his arm is fully extended, and he hits him right in the center of his chest, and he's keeping his eyes downfield. And then he has great athleticism to get to the right spot and reach the block on the linebacker. And this overtake combo can be with the center or the right tackle, just depending on whether you're play side or strong side. So you see here he's comboed with the right tackle Dennis Kelly, which on the back side is called a C block. And all he's supposed to do is just take his three steps and extend the arm. He doesn't need to hang around and do anything else because if he doesn't make contact, it most likely means the lineman took a false step anyways. I don't want to undersell Nate Davis's technical ability, but it's his athleticism that really sets him ahead as a zone blocker. A lot of teams just can't run outside zone because their linemen can't get to spots fast enough, and they definitely can't get there while maintaining the correct hand placement and footwork that Nate Davis does. That's why Tennessee tried to keep Dennis Kelly out of situations where he had to do a ton laterally because he's just a lot stiffer than the other linemen. And I think Dylan Radins will give them a lot more flexibility with block combinations on outside zone. Shifting to pass protection, I want to start with this play against Houston. Tennessee's running play action here, and in play action, the offensive line needs to sell the run also because a lot of times the linebackers are reading their keys off of the offensive line's movement. But you need to sell the run without putting yourself in a vulnerable position in pass protection. Watch how Nate Davis takes a fully extended lateral step like he would if they were running outside zone, and that gives the lineman an open path to the quarterback. And then look at how the other linemen engage with their blocks. They're still taking a step, but they aren't letting the pass rusher get around them. The same thing happens against Denver here, but you'll see Tannehill change the play once the Broncos shift their front. So either Davis had the same issue as the previous play, or Tannehill switched the play from a run to a pass and Davis didn't realize it. If you've watched any video where I talk about pass protection, you've heard me talk about how important it is to make first meaningful contact, and that's usually the main issue with Nate Davis. As someone who's a little bit lighter and doesn't have the best anchor, it's even more important that he becomes more proactive about using his length. There's a lot of plays like this other one against Denver where he looks a lot weaker than he actually is because the pass rusher starts bull rushing Davis before he even makes contact. I think if Nate Davis can provide us with any takeaways, it's the importance of scheme fit. Scheme fit is a word that gets thrown around a lot and seems to lack meaning in a lot of cases, but I think it can really make or break a player's success. In a West Coast offense like Tennessee's, I think Nate Davis is one of the most underrated guards in the NFL, but if you put him in a pro style offense that asked him to just pass protect and block ISO all game, I don't think he'd be that great. And that's not to say that Nate Davis isn't good on gap runs, which I haven't even mentioned in this video, it's just that zone blocking ability is a much less common skill set. Overall, Davis is one of my favorite players to watch, and I'm excited to see him continue to grow into a great all-around player. If you like my videos, make sure to subscribe and leave a like. I hate asking for likes, but this video took triple digit hours to make, so I'd really appreciate it. Also follow me on Twitter, and I'll put the link on the screen.